Okay, class. Uh, this again is Dr. Severin. In this unit, we'll be covering uh, the, an introduction to electrocardiography or ECG. So the objectives for this lecture will be going over a review of the cardiac conduction system. This should be similar to things we've covered in physiology, so we'll just briefly review that. We'll get into uh, an understanding of the ECG signal, and we'll go over some concepts of signal capture, um, which really kind of hopefully conceptualize uh, what the ECG is actually telling us. You can think of the ECG in many respects as an EMG of the, of the heart, right? So an EMG, of course, we're looking at the amplitudes and frequency and electrical activity basically produced by the uh, skeletal muscles, right? Well, it's often looking at. The ECG is the same concept, but looking at the, the muscle of the heart. So if you remember that concept, and remembering, you know, kind of you know, what this signal that we're capturing is, is, is coming from, um, it'll make interpretation when things are both normal and abnormal a little bit easier to understand. We'll get into interpretation, common arrhythmias, um, and a, a brief review of ischemic changes. We'll cover more of those things in our unit on cardiovascular disease, um, but we'll go over some of those things, uh, what we'll see in, in those uh, settings. So one thing I want to stress Electrophysiology is an entire subspecialty of cardi cardiology. So, you know, I'm not expecting you guys to walk out of here as experts being able to interpret every single, you know, random arrhythmia. But there are absolutely um, settings, especially if you're in an inpatient setting or a cardiac rehab setting where like you're, you're going to need to have a, a basic working knowledge of common conditions or at least an understanding of what, what you're seeing or when or not, whether or not a patient's appropriate to begin exercise, to continue exercise, or what do you need to do, um, you know, if maybe they're in an emergent situation. So again, it's an introduction here, and again, framing things from the perspective of a, of a physical therapist. So let's uh, dive into it. So the first thing we'll review, again, is, uh, again, the two types of cells that comprise the heart or the myocardial cells. Two types in general are conductive cells, which form obviously our conduction system. And then we have our uh, mechanical cells. Um, so the conductive cells have a higher percentage or higher number of ion channels, a greater uh, a capacity for self-excitation. And you can kind of think that these form basically the conduction system, the nervous system that basically runs through the heart and you know, distributed in this orderly stereotype fashion. And we'll get into more of those um, specific areas in a bit. There are mechanical cells, um, which form the, the thick muscular walls of both the atrium and really the ventricles. They have a greater force production. They have a lower amount of those ion channels. Um, but they're, they're really designed to, to propagate the signals produced by the conductive cells and to pump um, and you know, produce the force that pumps blood from our heart throughout our bodies. So, um, this is a quick review of those two types of cells. And it's really important for those two cells, again, to work kind of in coordination with each other. Uh, the next thing we'll cover or review is the annulus fibrosis. So people often kind of knock the notion that a heart is a muscle because like, well, it doesn't have an origin and insertion. Well, that may be actually, you know, true that it doesn't have a skeletal uh, attachment. It does actually have uh, one kind of contained within itself. Uh, it has this fibrous skeleton, the annulus fibrosis, um, which is a thick, dense uh, connective tissue that basically insulates um, the, the conduction system as well as the space between the atria and the ventricles. Um, helps reinforce the myocardium, gives it some structure as well, but it's a little bit of a fun fact. The heart actually kind of does have an origin in the surgeon, which would be this annulus fibrosis. So uh, next we'll get into a review of the conduction system. Again, this should be a review from physiology. Um, but just remembering the, this order, basically, of operations for how electrical activity or the action potential that's produced by the SA node and how that moves throughout the heart. And again, it's really important for this order to be maintained to allow for efficient um, and effective pumping and refilling of the ventricles. So if this thing gets messed up, we start having problems. And this is just a review of uh, the blood supply, and we'll get into this in, in more detail when we start getting into the, the walls, the heart that we're looking at on a certain ECG. So a uh, quick review again, uh, conduction starts in the SA node, which is the sinoatrial node, which is again, the right side kind of in the atria here. 
Um, it'll pass along then to uh, through the internodal fiber, so it'll move from the SA node uh, to the AV node. So we'll go back here. And then you can see here, there's a little space here, uh, connecting it to the AV node. And then from the AV node to the bundle of Hiss, to the bundle branches, and to the Purkinje fibers. Um, we'll get into each location in a bit and like why there are super, like, certain important things that happen along there. But um, again, this order happens from the very first beat that we have to the very last beat that we have. And it's really important for this order to be maintained. Um, and we'll get into the uh, why in a little bit. So again, SA node, AV node, okay, into our uh, bundle of Hiss, then to our bundle branches, right and left, and then to our Purkinje fibers throughout the, the ventricles. So the SA node, again, that's where everything sort of starts. Um, it's a dominant pacemaker, and it's the dominant pacemaker for this concept we call overdrive suppression. Um, overdrive suppression is a concept where um, basically the fastest pacemaker, right, or the pacemaker with the highest um, you know, discharge rate sets the pace because what it allows when that happens, if, if, it, if we're beating in coordination with this, you know, fast pacemaker, um, you know, we end up, it sets the pace for, you know, hyperpolarization as well as um, blocking out uh, any abnormal um, pacemakers, right? So because we're setting things at a faster pace, um, and because we kind of keep things in this coordinated fashion of hyperpolarization and depolarization, it blocks out any extraneous or we call it ectopic pacemakers. This is actually really important. This is how um, we're able, our, our, how our connection system is able to block out random abnormalities in our heart. And we'll get into some of those things, looking at reentrant loops, looking at AFib, looking at PVCs. As long as an SA node is kind of doing its job, um, it's going to keep the pace for everything, and it'll, it will block out, you know, even abnormal or irregular uh, pacemakers, which can be located in random spots throughout the, the heart. If the SA node is healthy, the conduction system is healthy because of overdrive suppression, it will, you know, keep the pace in a regular, in a regular or coordinated fashion. And if we can keep the pace and the rhythm coordinated, we can have effective and coordinated pumping, right, and delivery of blood throughout the throughout the body. So the SN is really important for, for that concept. Again, it's, it's do that overdrive suppression. And then we have the internodal and the interatrial tract. So the internodal tract that we mentioned propagate the signal from the SA node to the AV node through the, that's a basically a uh, connection between those two uh, segments or locations in the conduction system. And then we had the interatrial tracts, which again, help spread the signal from the SA node across the atria, right? because the atria have to contract um, and conduct and contract as well. And then we have the AV nodes. The AV node is responsible for delaying impulses. We'll get into why in a bit, um, but uh, another kind of key thing to remember that again we're, our goal is to keep everything uh, coordinated so when we send signals down from the SA node again it travels through the internodal tracks to our AV node and it's called AV node because it's exactly kind of where it is anatomically it's it's located between the septum basically between the atria here and the ventricle so AV node right here and right in the middle now the reason for this delay is the ventricles these thick guys here, remembering that, they have actually a very fast discharge rate, so our conduction rate, so our conduction velocity. So they discharge very quickly. So we need to make sure that things slow down a little bit there and they're given time to refill before another signal kind of gets sent. So the AV node allows for you know, coordinated contraction and filling of the ventricles, okay? So it's... Um, really important for giving the ventricles enough time to fill, right, so we get the most effective stroke volume, um, again, which contributes to our cardiac output. Now, another kind of thing to bear in mind, again, like we mentioned, there are conductive cells dispersed in that organized fashion throughout the heart, 
right? SA node has a bunch of the, those, pay, those connective cells, those pacemaker cells. The AV node, or really more or less the tissue surrounding the AV node, called like the junctional tissue, also contains some pacemakers. So uh, just like everything in our body, we've got a multiple redundancies. So if the SA node fails for some reason, we, you, know, like, you know, for fibrosis or age or ischemia or, or any reason, that AV node could potentially take over um, and set the pace as well. It's going to be a little bit slower um, than the SA node. Um, but again, the AV node can take over. Um, it has its own pacemaker cells there as well. And sometimes that's pathological, but uh, just bear that in mind. The SA node has pacemaker cells. Normally when that's healthy, that's due, setting the tone. Uh, this also has pacemaker cells. And then we'll get into our uh, bundle of Hiss and Purkinje fibers. So our bundle of Hiss, um, again, re resumes that rapid conduction of the impulse produced by the SA node that passes through the AV node. Um, and then it disperses the signals now into right and left uh, 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 branches, bundle branches. So sharing or splitting that signal between right and left heart. But again, if it's healthy, if those bundle branches are healthy, that signal gets or gets sent in a coordinated fashion, right? And right and left sort of beat around the same time. And then the Purkinje fibers um, is what's, you know, are, you know, help disperse that acronential to the myocardial tissue. They kind of, um, they, you know, they branch up into the endocardium and help disperse that action potential into the muscle fibers. So um, there really aren't uh, pacemakers located typically in the, you know, in these areas. Um, you know, the Purkinje fibers, sometimes you can, you can see a pacemaker cells in there. Very slow discharge rate um, compared to other locations. But um, again, the role really, the bundle, bundle of Hiss, Again, is this you know the pass through that um, signal from the AV node, splitting it to right and left ventricles. Their bundle branches, you know, split and send that signal as well. And their Purkinje fibers is kind of the final terminal point before getting into the ventricular myocardium. And that should say extends from the bundle branches. My apologies. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into the phase of the cardiac action potential, but it's not too dissimilar from what we've covered or what's been covered in physiology. But uh, just remembering that, you know, the you know, phase four is at rest. Cells are the resting uh, phase, um, ready to receive an electrical stimulus. Then we get to phase zero, which is that upstroke. And then phase one is the spike. That's when uh, contraction begins. The reason why I bring this up, and I believe we have a, an image of this later on, is just remembering that, all the, all the ECG is really showing us is the electrical activity produced by the heart, which occurs by the flow of ions across the membrane, right? Those transmembrane potentials and, and efflux and influx of ions. All that, all this ECG is just showing that activity, that movement, or right? that change in current. And it's rendering or filtering different waves that are produced by that electrical activity onto a recording. So if any one of you guys will get into these signal capture concepts later on, but that's basically what it's showing, right? So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you questions. We've had, you know, you've been assessed in physiology before, but it's remembering kind of what this looks like. So again, you know, phase zero is an up, up, up stroke, just like we see with any action potential. We have our peak, and then we have again, egress in, of, of ions. And again, phase three is uh, we're in our repolarization phase, and then again, once we're back to uh, phase four, is when we're you know we're ready to receive a normal uh, action potential. So again, four zero um, four to zero spike. Slow repolarization happens um, in this phase here, the plateau, and then we get into the remaining parts of repolarization until we're back into the resting membrane potential. And again, all the ECG is just a rendering of all of those different electrical activities occurring throughout the heart. And we'll get into like, you know, we're able to pick out certain areas or activity from certain areas because we can we have an understanding of what they look like on, on the signal, which is a standardized frequency that we're capturing at, standardized filter that we're capturing activity from as well. Another thing, a really important thing to bear in mind is that you know, the activity from the heart, right, per, in, it kind of moves in a, in, again, the stereotype uh, pattern, right? So it moves from right to left, right? So it starts kind of the SA node, spreads across, 
and then superior to inferior, right? So it starts from the right upper right corner and spreads in this direction, as you guys can kind of see here, and that it moves from inside out. This will make more sense when we start getting into vectors and looking at, le at the leads and, um, and electrodes. Um, but, you know, again, looking at how the signal, the electrical activity um, passes through the heart. And why is this all important? Again, you know, you can think of the electrical activity of the heart or the electrical system or the conduction system of the heart. It's basically the computer um, for our heart, right? It sets you know, the, the functions of the machines, which are the pumping, um, the, you know, the, the myocardial cells, right, our thicker, thicker cells there. Um, electrical events dictate the mechanical events, right? So if we have uncoordinated electrical activity, we'll have uncoordinated um, pumping performance, right? So you can think of it this way, that electrical events dictate mechanical events. And conversely, mechanical changes to the heart, if we have ischemia, if we have hypertrophy or, over, or abnormal pathological hypertrophy, or if we have scarring, that's going to affect the ability for those electrical signals to spread evenly, uniformly, um, and, and rhythmically, right? Which we need, right, to allow for efficient pumping, right? So, and, and remembering again, looking at our, our Wigger diagram, that again, electrical events predict or, or, or lead to mechanical events. So when we're looking at the ECG, we're not looking at the, the mechanical properties. We're not looking at contraction. We're looking at depolarization. We're looking at conduction, right? So there's first an electrical impulse or activity, and then, then there is contraction, right? Or isolometric contractions we see here on the pressure diagram, right? So just remembering that. Electrical events predict um, and, and come before the mechanical events, and the ECG is capturing the electrical events, which can be influenced by mechanical events. But again, just remembering what we're primarily looking at at the ECG is the electrical activity in the heart, which is, again, related to mechanical properties, but it's they're slightly different. And then just remembering things that control cardiac output, obviously neural. Um, we've got our sympathetic, our autonomic, sympathetic, and parasympathetic their receptors are also involved in as well, as well. There's different chemical things that can affect heart rate, different pharmacological um, agents, catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine. Um, and then we have intrinsic properties, Frank Sterling property, right? If we have a higher stretch, we're going to have a higher um, you know, force production. And then we're going to have uh, you know, changes maybe related to ischemia or acidosis. There's a lot of anything that can change any of those intrinsic properties of the heart will affect potentially cardiac output and, and pumping performance. And then there's other things as well to bear in mind that at rest, the parasympathetic nervous system is predominating, pumps to brakes on heart rate. When we begin to exercise, we end up seeing a withdrawal of, of vagal tone, the parasympathetic tone, and a gradual increase in sympathetic tone to match heart rate to the given activity that we're experiencing, right? And there's other things that uh, tie into that as well, catecholamine release, inhibition of the uh, bear reflex. And there are other factors too. We think inspiration um, has an influence on vagal tone by affecting thoracic pressures, temperature as well. Um, a little kind of fun party trick, if you kind of place your, uh, you know, your fingers over your carotid pulse, get, you know, to feel that gently. If you take a deep breath in, you'll notice your uh, heart rate go up a little bit. And if you hold your breath, you might notice that go down. We think that has something to do with trying to match um, cardiac output or, or filling in the, or sorry, perfusion to the lungs um, at uh, inspiration. So that's something that, you know, we think is a, an evolved thing, but it's kind of, kind of a little cool party trick that you can kind of teach people to, you know, to change their heart rate. So uh, that ends, again, our little review of cardiac electrical physiology. Um, we'll get into more specifics on the ECG in the following lecture. So uh, yeah, well, I'll see you in the next part.